Thanks. And with that, we'll start off with Deb Nicholson. Great. Good morning. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to talk about trolls for a brief minute, and then I'm going to talk about the larger issue of software patents. Um, in case you can't tell from my accent, I live in the U.S., and uh, so a lot of that is going to be from the U.S. perspective. And I do know we're here in Europe, but uh, software patent suits tend to be one of those things that we export, and I'm sorry about that. I'm also sorry about Lady Gaga, but uh, <laughs> I really can't do anything about that. Um, so, uh, and this is also interesting for even, you know, if you uh, don't intend to leave Europe, if your company wants to do business in the U.S., so it puts you at risk for uh, infringement for U.S. companies. So, uh, well, the ones that are willing to sue. So, there's a nice bridge without a troll. And then the trolls came. Um, in case you, like this troll, have been hiding under a rock, um, trolls are expensive. This is, uh, this is from 2011. That number's only gone up. Uh, 80 billion money, <coughs> cash monies, uh, that's U.S. dollars, lost per year. Uh, the number is going up, and this, uh, I think, would be up here if it went through 2013. Um, so that's like what we call exponential increase. And, uh, and then even more worrying, uh, instead of just large, giant mega corporations uh, slugging it out, patent trolls are increasingly targeting users and adopters, which is particularly problematic for free software folks because, um, you know, it's, it means like, oh, oh, you don't want to use that free software stuff because it's all patent encumbered and you're totally going to get sued, which sounds like FUD until like, your customer gets an actual letter. So, um, so that's worrying. And uh, then it turns out that trolls are everywhere. After, after, um, after those numbers, like, all of a sudden, people started to notice. In the U.S., uh, the National Public Radio ran two shows on the topic of patent trolls. Um, so finally, like, my family members who are like, what is it that you do again? It's something with the law and software or wherever. And they're like, oh, I saw the NPR spot. So then it was like, okay, so now they understood what I was, you know, what I've been talking about. Um, academics wrote about their problem. If anyone wants to get recommendations for oodles of academic papers to read on this topic, let me know. And uh, the Government Accounting Office, which is basically like the budget bean counting part of the U.S. government, um, did a giant report saying like, this is not really good for our financial health. And the Federal Trade Commission, which is supposed to look at the trade and how it's run in the U.S., um, not only did they write two, like, 300-plus page reports, they now have plans to do something about the troll problem. So I think we can say that that is being looked at. Um, and legislation is also being talked about. There's a six-part piece, six piece of legislation that is being floated in Congress. Um, some parts are good and some parts are less interesting. Some of them read on specifically the troll problem and some of them read more broadly. So we'll go through each a little bit and um, take a look. So it's called the Innovation Act. Uh, the first piece is called heightened pleading and that means you have to actually declare what you're suing about. So this is great for uh, if you're getting sued by like a seven level shell corporation and uh, something that's basically a company on a piece of paper and nowhere else. Um, so uh, you get, uh, they have to say like what patents they're using and what piece of property they think that you're infringing on. So it's, it gets rid of that like, oh, it could be anything sort of thing. So that would be great. Um, fee shifting is where we would make uh, the loser in the litigation pay the fees. So the goal there is to disincentivize sending out 100 or 300 letters and seeing what shakes out. Um, because you'd have to pay any fees that people would go at. Uh, the problem that this does not address is if the patent is not completely vague and you're sending something less than 300 letters as a troll or whatever. And um, your company isn't willing to put like tens of thousands of dollars on the line in the hopes that they'll get it back at the end of the process when they win the suit. So this is more helpful for a larger company than for a smaller company. Uh, stopping discovery abuse. Uh, do you guys know what discovery means in the legal sense? So 
the process is like this. You, you get a letter saying, we think you're infringing. And then once you start up the whole court process, they send you a list of documents that they'd like to see as evidence for the court case that you're going to have. Um, discovery abuse, which is like more common than the regular discovery, I think, um, means you, you send, I want everything. I want all your emails from the last seven years. I want every piece of paper that exists in your office. Print it out. I want like all the stuff. Um, discovery abuse in this fashion is like the bane of legal interns everywhere. This is like why you see like young legal interns like with bags under their eyes because they were up until like midnight photocopying like thousands of pages that in a, a super unmotivating way they know no one will ever read. The company that's asking for like tens of thousands of pages of discovery is not going to read it. They're just trying to make it expensive and annoying for you to be sued by them. So uh, this would be great to, for all kinds of suits, like just for the humanitarian reasons we should stop discovery of use. <laughs> all those poor legal interns. Um, so that, that's, that's on the table in the Inter Innovation Act. Better transparency, this is disclosing the real party and interest. So if, uh, you know, the parent corporation has sold other patents to like a smaller company, uh, you would know what the, yeah. Or do you have a question? A thought. A thought. But it, it can wait if you want. Is it about this specific? It was about the previous thing. Oh, on the... Um, discovery abuse. Yeah. Could you stop discovery abuse by requiring that the law firm which got all of these bits of paper bill their clients at least one minute for each piece of paper delivered? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, they've got to be reading them, right? Otherwise... Huh. Well, it depends. I mean, so like the company that's asking for all the discovery is not the one that's producing it. Right, but the point is they wouldn't ask for it all oh. if it then meant that the client was stuck with a thumping great fee for all the lawyers reading. Oh, oh, oh I see what you mean. Right. So actually one piece of this, I didn't go into a lot of detail here, but uh, one piece of this is that if you wanted discovery outside of the core of the case that the uh, the plaintiff would have to pay for the discovery abuse. So the making them pay for the frivolous reams of paper is kind of already tucked into that idea. But cool. Um, so this real party and interest, uh, so that you actually know who you're being sued by and who stands to financially gain. I think this is this is interesting because it's good to know who the real party and interest is. But if their interest is not financial, then it doesn't really help you out. So. Um, we never really figured out like if the cozy relationship between Acacia and Microsoft was real, but uh, they weren't getting money, but they might have been like silently cheering them on. So if there's not a financial relationship, then you wouldn't necessarily see that with the transparency. Um, limited protection for end users. This is another one that's great for a large corporation. Uh, it means that if your customers and users get sued, the parent company can come in and be like, hey, 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 leave the customers alone, go after the big guy, like, you know, and, and step in. But if, you're, if the software creator is a couple of volunteers, then they can't really step in and take on the lawsuit on behalf of all of their users who didn't pay any money for the software anyway. So you see where this is, the more money you have, the more useful this is for you. Um, and then this would be awesome, uh, review the patent at the USPTO while the litigation is on hold. So court case comes through and it's like, Rrr. all right, litigation stops, the US Patent and Trade Office takes a look at this patent to see if it's actually like they should have granted it in the first place. That would be awesome, but it got taken off the table. So um, that's a, do you guys know the whole adage about uh, sausage and how you don't want to see it being made? Laws are exactly the same thing. So um, this is. So what does all this mean for the future? So that's like we talked about litigation and everything. I think it means that steampunk is going to outlast like classic over patent trolls, which is I think good. So we have all this conversation about trolls, and and we may actually get around to doing something about that. So I finally, as a person from the U.S., get to say like I think we are really going to do something about that. Um, so again with the awesome, no matter how you feel about steampunk, it's still better than patent trolls. Um, except the patent system still has huge problems. Like, huge problems. So even if we got rid of all of the trolls, and those are just non-practicing entities, companies that don't do anything, um, we still have 
problems. And so just to recap why we all care, um, whether you are being sued by an actual practicing entity or a troll, it doesn't matter. You're still over here and your money has been taken. So for us in the free software community, it's like, well, I don't really care who takes all the money and grinds my business out of existence. I mean, maybe you care a little bit, but in the end, you're still being both for money and being ground out of existence. Um, so uh, the other thing that's more worrying is that the line between what is a troll and what is an actual real company has been getting blurrier. So instead of seeing all of this disgusting troll behavior and being like, man, we should never do that. They're like, hey, where'd you guys get all the money? Can we talk about that? Because that looks like, like, I mean, you guys are doing great. Money hand over fist. So that's very worrying. I'll take a look at, uh, in specific, um, Microsoft and Nokia sold a bunch of patents, about 1,200 patents for a very small sum to a troll called... Uh, well, it's M-O-S-A-I-D, but uh, they changed their name to Conversant. I want to make sure you the money, the numbers there are correct for you. Um, and so they sold them 1,200 1, patents for $20,000 U.S., which is, I mean, that's basically, like I don't know if you've ever done this thing where you buy a car from a neighbor and you don't want to pay the tax, and you're like, sell me your car for a dollar, and then I'll pay tax on the dollar, and then you give them whatever like you're supposed to give them. Which, you know, it, in, a, in a libertarian world, that's awesome, right? But uh, for this, it means that they get to avoid the fair, reasonable, and uh, non-discriminatory things. So Conversant doesn't make anything, uh, but they have all these Microsoft and Nokia patents. And so that they can sue on, and so it's not it's not uh, going against the non-discriminatory aspect because they're not actually a competitor in that field because they don't they don't make anything. What I think is also interesting is they uh, I looked them up, and they have uh, they have offices in Plano, Texas, which is not that far from that famous Eastern District where all the patents happen, and then one in Ottawa. I, I don't know if you have like. They had a Linux Fest one year, and then so I don't know what's going on in Ottawa. And then the other office is in Luxembourg. I thought maybe you guys would know what's going on in Luxembourg. Shell companies. Shell company. That's oh, is it's like oh, it's the Delaware of Europe. Yes. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, okay, that makes sense. I I was wondering. I was like Luxembourg. That's so weird. And Texas. So um, yeah. So they sold 1,200 patents to this uh, to this company, and then. Um, they have a deal that if it, it stops making them money, that they'll buy them back, um, which is <laughs> it's really weird. So, um, so that's kind of um, worrying. And you know, the the non-discriminatory; those are like patents on the core, rather than like you know, like the bells and whistles on technology. Are people kind of familiar with that concept? Okay. Um, let's see. So, um, so that means if, uh, if Microsoft is what keeps you up at night, you can continue to not sleep, I guess. Because um, they have, they've offloaded their um, anti-competitive behavior to a subsidiary. And other companies have been doing this same thing, where they've offloaded their, um, their stuff to a subsidiary, or we've been increasingly seeing more and more suits where a practicing entity has patent holdings in an area that they don't deal with, and then has been suing companies in that area. So it be it makes them so they have they have customers that and and employees and they do things and they write software, but then they have patents in this other area like glommed onto their business. Maybe they're in a different building. I don't know, but. Um, and then they sue, com they sue companies that they're not in direct competition with because they have all these patents. So they've got like a troll arm, which is weird, right? So then it's like, you know, then you get these things where like pro-patent folks are like, but that company really does stuff and they really make software and, and these reforms you're talking about would hurt people with real jobs. And, and, they, and the, it's true, there are people with real jobs at that company, but they have a troll arm. 
So, so that's worrying. So then, you know, all of these reforms when we're looking uh, at, like, how do we fix the problem? And in the U.S., it's like, how do we fix the troll problem? That's a conversation people want to have. Because we, we really hate the idea of people not working and getting money. Like, you can work, and it can be dirty work, and that's okay, and get money. But if you're not working and getting money, then we're not okay with that. So a lot of the legislation and reform being talked about in the U.S. is troll-only targeted or, or very, like, high highly um, effective only on the troll problem, but not on the larger problem of anti-competitive suits or the ever fuzzying line between practicing entities and non-practicing entities. So anti-competitive suits, we're lucky we haven't seen uh, so many overt ones, but I think we might see them return if we got rid of the trolls. So um, all you have to do is be willing to put your name on the suit, right? And uh, if it's not about money, maybe you don't even have to do that. You can just let someone do it. If your goal is to squash a market competitor or manipulate the market in a certain way or inject fear um, into the community of people who might use free software, then you don't even need to be financially benefiting from the suits. You're just you're benefiting from them like kind of in the around the back door. So but we may see them come back again if we got rid of the troll problem. There's nothing, uh, there's very little being talked about that would go to that, uh, that speaks to that specific problem. Um, and then, the, you know, when it's not a court case, but it's cross-licensing request, we see these kinds of shakedowns like, you know, oh, you know, it sure would be a shame if we had to send you like a more serious letter. Maybe instead you'd like to cross-license. So that's like, you know, again, so the things that go at frivolous court cases don't really touch the, I'm going to send you a letter telling you that I might send you another letter about a court case, unless you cross license. So that's, uh, that's another thing that we're not going to see picked up if we eliminate the troll problem but don't look at some larger issues. So, um, and then lastly, like, I think this is super gross. Schools are increasingly forming relationships with non-practicing entities. So they're, uh, they're in this special spot where they're like they're supposed to be like research think tanks, um, so they're not practicing entities, but then they're providing patents to companies that are using them for anti-competitive or trollish behavior. Uh, and in fact, Intellectual Ventures we know has relationships that we know about with over 300 schools, and schools uh, that's. I don't see this leak getting plugged because um, schools are kind of famously always short of money. So someone comes by and says like, oh, we'll give you money for something. And they're usually like, yeah, I got the pen out already. I don't even care what it is. But, you know, so, so we see these kinds of things. And then schools get named as a party of interest as a, in, a, in a lawsuit too. So again, this is another place where um, we're seeing the tentacles of the patent system, uh, not only from trolls, but in concert with schools. So um, so that's all of these places uh, and all of these entities hiding in plain sight, uh, actually using troll, troll behaviors and troll tactics to make it more gross, well, <laughs> and then also like more irritating for us to do our jobs, which is just make free software and get stuff out to people and, you know, we could go back to talking about making a nice user interface and all of those kinds of things. So, all right. So, the legislation is incomplete um, and the corporate backdailing remains robust. Uh, and then we have the courts. So um, the U.S. I know more about the U.S. courts, and again, like I said, unfortunately, this is one of those things that we export, so it is interesting. But some of the things that um, I'm going to look at have analogs at the European Patent Office. So some of the problems that exist with the U.S. Patent and Trade Office uh, also exist with the European Patent Office. And I know it's it is nice to say like, oh, well, we don't have patents in Europe for software and. I think probably most of you in that room know that that's, you don't have as many. Like, if it was, you know, if it was just a numbers game, like, the U.S. is totally winning. But, um, you know, in a, in, in a way that I wish we were not. But, um, but Europe is, they're working to catch up. And as, as some districts more so than others. So, uh, let's take a look. Um, this was great. In New York, um, there was a troll that was forced to return the money. So this is a state-level suit. It was a, 
I think it's MP, oh yeah, MPHJ, again, more with the acronyms, but they were re ordered to repay all the license money that they had shaken down. And, um, and the, the state level court said that they had to conduct um, a serious good faith effort, that if you're going to bring a patent suit in New York State, you have to conduct a serious good faith effort. And the way that the U.S. court system works, this precedent doesn't spread up to the inter, you know to the national level it only holds in New York so this means like companies that don't want to um, conduct a serious good faith effort to really do due diligence and find out like um, are you actually infringing before they send a bunch of letters will just avoid the New York uh, districts so um, but it is still nice to see like one state that was like, yeah, I don't know, we're going to just make our own president and be like, that sucks. Yeah. If your business is in New York, does this give you any protection or can they just mm -hmm. sue you somewhere else? Yeah, uh, so the way that, um, so the question is about standing really, right? And um, the reason that so much stuff ends up in that East Texas district is because you only need one person using the software in the district to get standing. So. Um, so, not really, unless you're providing software specifically for something New York-y that, like, only people in New York use. Like, I don't know, like a, like a, like the, that yelling soup dude, like an app for that or something. So, um, I don't live in New York, so I, I don't know what those things would be. But, uh, okay, so this is interesting also. Uh, I don't know if folks have been following this. This is Akamai versus Limelight. So um, in 2006, Akamai, which is an actual practicing and they hire people, they have a giant office in Cambridge where I live, um, they sued Limelight for infringing on its patented technology of managing web images and video. So um, I don't know, this is pretty, this is some pretty amazing secret sauce. Um, but uh, at the lower level, it was like, well, uh, yeah, no, and then the Federal Circuit said, huh, it seems like we could find that a manufacturer and a user that are doing different parts of a process could together be taken to be infringing, which is, that's, that's definitely different. That's like, the whole process is patented. The company provides some part, and then the user provides another part. But since the whole process is something that someone patented, aside from the question of whether they should have that patent, that the court is like, well, all right, that, that seems like infringement, even if it's like two groups or two separate entities contributing to the infringement. Um, so, uh, and, and a lot of companies have filed in favor of Limelight saying like, hey, we don't really think that whole contributory infringement thing is a great idea. So the Supreme Court is going to hear that. And then, you know, so they have an opportunity there to be like, yes, please leave the users alone. And please stop considering their actions part of a contributory infringement. So that's, uh, the courts are, well, like most human endeavors, composed of individual people. But more so than most, it's a, it's a little bit of a black box. You put something in and you don't really know what you're going to get out. Dead cat, not dead cat, until it's finished. So, uh, so we don't really know what's going to happen on that, but it is going to be um, heard sometime in the next year, we believe. Um, this, if, uh, if the Supreme Court finds for Akamai, I think this would be very bad for market underdogs um, or users of software made by companies that aren't willing to step in and bankroll a giant lawsuit. Um, so, which probably describes a lot of free software projects, right? All right, so, and the, so the future of end user suits, we don't know. Um, this one is really interesting. This is another one that the Supreme Court decided to hear this year. Um, Biosig versus Nautilus. And this is not a software uh, issue. This is like a hardware issue, but it kind of goes to the um, functional claiming problem. So one of the problems with the patent system in the U.S. and that sort of leached out to other countries and places too is the idea of functional claiming where you say, I see a problem and then I'm going to fix it with some 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 stuff like in software it's like I'm gonna fix it on a computer 
And so you don't necessarily have all the steps of exactly what you're doing. And, and that's what arrives, that's how we arrive at all these vague patents that cover things like, oh, I guess when you turn it that way, like, you could mean anything. Um, and so this one is interesting because um, it's a heart rate monitor that the user grips while they're uh, holding exercise equipment. And the, the key piece of the patent is that um, it, apparently, like, if you have just one sensor on the hand, then it can be subject to noise or whatever. But if you have two sensors, then they, uh, they sort of correct for each other. And so they said, we put two sensors in a spaced relationship, which is super vague, right? A spaced relationship. Like, they in space. They're not... <laughs> They're not on top of each other. They don't occupy the same space. It's two sensors. And so they weren't very specific. And so then it went back and forth on this thing where it was like, so they're in a spaced relationship. And the, you know, one company's like, well, um, we're, we're using it, but it, it might not be the same spaced relationship. And then the, the company that is the plaintiff is like, well, but it's, they didn't quite use the word obvious, but basically they're saying it's pretty obvious it has to be somewhere in the vicinity of the size of the human hand. So is it obvious or is it vague and indefinite? We don't know yet. Um, well, we know the district court said uh, it was indefinite, that a spaced relationship is, is kind of BS and you, that, you can't have that. So um, the Supreme Court's going to hear that. I don't know what they're going to find. Again, with the black box. Um, you know, uh, it might get more expensive to go to the gym in the meantime, who knows. Um, so, yeah, so they could choose, the, the Supreme Court could take this as an opportunity to provide more guidance on how fuzzy is too fuzzy for a patent. So that's, that's kind of the nutshell there, which would be great if they decided that a lot of the stuff that we read and we're like, that's pretty fuzzy. And if the Supreme Court chose to say, yeah, no more fuzzy. That would be awesome. They may not do that. They're not the, you know, like I said, black box. But a little, I, I try to bring a little bit of good news. So, um, and so indefiniteness is that, that's the, the legal term for fuzzy. Uh, and then this one, uh, did you guys read about this one, Sovereign versus Newegg? A little bit. This is one where, that the Supreme Court chose not to take, but is actually really good news. Because, um, so Sovereign is this company that got some patents from another company and maybe has like a support line. We're not sure. Like, it depends on who you read. Like, if you read like the super pro patent blogs, they're like, that poor company, they totally have people working and doing things. And then like on the other side, it's like, yeah, I think your data might be like 10 years out of date, like they're not really bank making any stuff anymore, so it's hard to tell, like they've been a little shifty, no one's visited their office, if you guys want to pay me to go to their office for fun, I will. Um, but they sued Newegg on online shopping carts. On a patent that had originally been filed in 1994 and was granted in like 97, 98, it's, a, it's like a family of maybe three patents. and. Um, and, the, and they've, they've sued a number of different companies on these before. And uh, courts had previously said, like, yeah, well, actually, shopping carts were sort of revolutionary in 1997 or whatever. And, um, but then, like, the, they, they won in the infamous Eastern District of Texas first. And then Newegg appealed because they're like, yeah, screw this. We're not getting sued over and over again. Um, and when it went up to the Federal Circuit. And the Federal Circuit said, this stuff is obvious. It should never have been granted as a patent, which is great. And then Sovereign said, like, tried to get the Supreme Court to take this on and overturn it. And the Supreme Court's like, no, we're not going to touch that. So them not taking that case is good news for us, right? Um, I think uh, this is interesting. The uh, Sovereign's president, Catherine Wannick, said it's a really tough time to be a patent owner, right? And the, Sorry, not sorry, as the kids would say. I couldn't even find a sad violin for her. I'm s just, you know. Okay. So, um, anyway, so that's that's uh, that's what's going on with the Supreme Courts. Like I said, they're unpredictable. The cases could take a long time. They may, like, the Supreme Courts, like, they're not super over with their schedule until they've actually scheduled it. 
Um, and even if a court precedent gets established, it doesn't necessarily impact the flow of threatening nebulous letters. So like this is those are all great news if they go you know if that precedent gets handed down and you actually have to go to court you have some great legal precedences to draw on but it doesn't stop someone from sending like I'm going to go to court with you because court is really expensive so does everyone understand what I'm saying there you know how much lawyers make right a lot okay no offense not all of them not all of them <laughs> <laughs> so um. Okay, so the Supreme Court of the U.S., unpredictable, um, and predators may not be affected, uh, which is bad news because here we are hanging out without, <laughs> without millions and billions of dollars to fight them. So, uh, so what could we do about that? Uh, community solutions. Uh, so I work at the Open Invention Network, which runs some of these, but I'm not only mentioning OIN solutions, and I'm going to talk about some stuff that we're not working on, and some of that is not from my employer, and some is, so. Um, but uh, we run a non-aggression pact, which is where uh, free software and um, folks working on GNU and Linux and related stuff uh, all agree to not sue each other. So that's at least, like, in your area, you could have folks not sue you. Uh, we also have a defensive patent pool for if you get sued by a practicing entity from outside the community, you have those resources. Again, that doesn't stop at the flow of letters if you're not willing to go to court, but if you are willing to go to court, we have resources for you. Um, use the GPL because it mentions patents, and when the DPL is ready, um, I assume I, re I don't have to explain the GPL in here, right? <laughs> okay. Um, the, the DPL is a defensive patent license, and that means that if a patent is held by a community member that we trust at some point, and then maybe for whatever reason they go out of business, it gets fire sale, et cetera, et cetera, um, you could use that license to uh, whatever immunities and cross deals that you had made, uh, hopefully like unpaid cross deals, uh, those immunities would follow the patent through to the end. So if you had if you had a patent on something, and a lot of companies do this because venture capitalists are looking for it, they're like, if you don't have a patent, we don't want to give you money. So you have one, but then maybe your that idea didn't work. You sell the patent. If it's under the defensive patent license, assuming all the legal kinks get worked out there, um, everyone that you had offered immunity to would continue to have immunity for the life of that patent, You'd like 18 years after that company's gone under. Does that make sense? There's, I can, if anyone wants, I can give you a link for more info on that. Um, and then finally, I think uh, lobbying for software specific reforms in your local patent regime. Um, and so uh, we like to say like, oh, you know, it's, it's very tempting to say like, let's get rid of all intellectual property and, you know, share all the things. Um, I think that's going to be more difficult, like just the sheer volumes of money it, and taking on pharma while we're already like taking on like large proprietary software companies is going to be difficult. So that's why I say software specific reforms and I'll say the ones that uh, I think we should look at specifically. Every patent system has its own challenges um, and these are the ones that I think for the U.S. would work, but some of these I think would be worth pursuing in the European Union as well. Um, complete transparency when suits are brought, and that's in the Innovation Act. I feel like that one's really critical. I think there's a good uh, groundswell of support for that particular type of reform. Like, nobody really likes to be sued by a secret masked entity, um, even more so than they don't like to be sued by a known entity, I guess. Um, and so, and that, and I think this goes to like when when you talk to people who are, have no skin in this game, you're like, that doesn't seem fair that you can be sued by a secret company. So, you know, that has a good amount of support, I think. Um, much shorter lifespans for software patents. Uh, currently, it's it's 20 years here in the EU. It's 20 years in the U.S. Uh, for software, that's ridiculous, right? So. I don't think we could get shorter lifespans for patents as a whole, but I think we could lobby for shorter patents for software, just given the way that the industry is. It's, it could be a stepping stone to none at all, but I think uh, I think we could live with two years or three years more than 20. 
I don't think this is realistic. I don't remember if it is trips or some other international agreements that every relevant country has signed. Yeah. It requires the minimum to be 20 years. Yeah, so... so it requires a, an agreement from all signatories. It will never happen. First it would be difficult, yeah. So... Oh, I'm sorry. He Please said that there's... Uh, uh, because of... Not enough. Yeah, international treaties uh, have a lot of the... I think it's trips has... Um, 20 years in as a minimum for software patent or for patent life. So, so that would be a long, slow. Yeah. How would you define a software patent? I mean, wouldn't people draft their patents for good like machines to avoid the shorter lifespan? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. So, the question is uh, how would you define a software patent? If uh, you could get a shorter lifespan for software <laughs> patent, uh, would people tr like try to avoid having their thing described as software? Yeah, well, but in the process they'd probably have to change like which aspect of their work they're patenting, right? So, yeah, so that's like work remains to be done. I'm not an international treaty drafter, but uh, I, I think there's I'm speaking from a perspective of I think there's public support for this. As opposed to, you know, some of the other solutions that have been <coughs> talked about. Some are too tiny and some are too sweeping. I think that there would be public support for this. So, um, eliminating functional claiming by requiring less fuzziness in patent applications. We already have a situation where different types of patents have different benchmarks. So, for instance, uh, bioinformatics patents have to clearly define the end of their scope. Uh, and they have to be much more specific about what they're doing because uh, like human beings are involved and they want to make sure you're not patenting human body processes. Um, so this is a thing that the U.S. Patent and Trade Office already does where they uh, require different, they have a higher benchmark for certain types of patent applications. So we could ask for this for software. Um, and then uh, don't financially incentivize the patent office. So that's a huge problem. So um, this, and this is the case in the, at the EPO as well. So not just the USPTO, but basically the patent office, which is underfunded, um, gets more money for granting patents than for not granting patents. So I, I don't know if you've ever been to a store and you could tell someone was working on commission. They're like, no, I think we have one in your size. Wait, I have it in another color. No, 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 don't leave. I have more. Like, come back, come back. Like, so this is the USPTO when you're, it's like, yeah, uh, well, the way this is worded isn't so great, but maybe if you struck that sentence, I could give you your patent. So you have that kind of relationship between the patent applicant and the patent examiner. And that, like I said, this is both at the USPTO and the EPO. And, and maybe other ones too. I didn't do like a comprehensive. Yeah. That is insidious. So uh, Martha's point is that um, the because under the unitary patent system, uh, individual courts are incentivized to find uh, more favorably for patents, uh, and so uh, it becomes this very insidious thing where they're competing with each other. Uh, especially as in the U.S., we see the forum shopping where everyone always ends up in East Texas. Um, but in the EU, you could have a similar, like, no, really, we're super easy over here kind of a, a thing. Is that a, a kind of encapsulated? Which will then have a in effect. 
but because this court is then based in different jurisdictions, it means that they can effectively financially compete with each other. Right, so individual course decision stands for the whole union. Right, that was, a, yeah, sorry. To me, that's like, oh, that's kind of how we work in the U.S. already with the circuits, but um, <laughs> more, more crap that we've exported. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so... Yes. So the and and specific stuff. So like obviously in Europe, the the unitary patent thing has not come into effect, and so that's those are different opportunities than we have for lobbying in the U.S. So, um, and uh, and uh, if you want to talk more about the unitary patent afterwards, we definitely should. Um, so individual activities uh, that I, I think would be helpful uh help with patent busting so one of the things that we have now in the u.s is where you can participate in the process before patents are granted and send in prior art saying like no you cannot have that so i just saw one that was like um you know when you send email and it and the word attach is in your email and you get a little box that's like hey you forgot it looks like you meant to send an attachment so that's like a current pending patent in the u.s I, I uh, honestly like <laughs> it boggles the mind. I feel like a screenshot, pretty much from anywhere before that was granted, would be sufficient to uh, provide prior art for that. Um, oh, of course, it's a process, and then there's a lot of like irritating verbiage that goes with it. But um, so help with patent investing, and there's a couple of great sites, and I'll list the links for those sites at the end. Um, Tell your lawmakers why this matters to you, why like the troll problem and fixing that is not sufficient. Um, and that's for wherever you live. And you know, specific, specifically with the unitary patent solution here, or uh, situation here in Europe, so. Um, and then talk to colleagues and friends about predators. I feel like one of the great drivers behind seeing the work being done to combat the troll problem in the U.S. is because of public awareness. Um, like it or not, uh, software developers, free software developers are a very small percentage of the overall population. I mean, growing, but still. Um, and if uh, people don't know about their problem, there's there needs to be like public support for change. Um, and, and I know it's fun to talk about trolls. There's a lot of like amazingly ridiculous stories. There's like the time Nathan Mervold sued himself, and those stories are fun and hilarious to share, but um, less maybe less glamorous and, and less punchline or like, oh, and then my friend's like two person business went under because they got an anti competitive letter. It's, it isn't as great and exciting of a story, but you could put some heart into it, and I think sharing those stories is important. Um, so, what we know about the general public's attention span, maybe more so in the U.S. than here, uh, it's short. You guys know how goldfish, like everything is new every three seconds. Um, and then what we know about practicing entities is that uh, they're willing to play dirty. Um, you guys know the, the Microsoft butterfly logo, right? Um, they, uh, and increasingly, practicing entities are willing to use troll tactics to influence the market, skim money off the top, all of those things that uh, had been done, you know, that w trolls are famous for, are being done by practicing entities now. So, uh, picture credits, and these are a couple of the sites where you can participate in patent busting if you want to. Uh, Linux Defenders, that's the one OAN runs. Trolling Effects is the EFF site. Uh, and then Sack Exchange uh, has a, a patent portal as well for doing patent busting. So, if you uh, if you have time for that, that's awesome. Um, this uh, paper by Kling Chen uh, in uh, association with the New America Foundation uh, particularly talks about the blurry line between practicing entities and non-practicing entities. So, if you want more on that, and you want to, or you want to go down and visit your uh, what do you call them parliamentarians or Okay, um, you can go, you can take, you can find some data in there, and I, and I think that's, um, it's a good time. Uh, so, uh, I have a few minutes for questions. I know people have questions, and uh, I would love to hear them. Thanks. All right, one in the front. Uh -huh.
I think you are aiming too low. Uh, whenever you speak about uh, compromise reform, alleviating some of the problems you perceive correctly in the mm -hmm. US system, you are in some way legitimizing the, the existence of sort of patents, which is not the case formally in Europe. So we still have officially binding and existing laws, since the software is not transparentable, even, even if uh, the, 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 the guidelines are violated every single day and software patents are granted. They would sure. be void if we go to court, but we know that people do not. It's expensive. Court. So you're saying I'm shooting too which, low, which I appreciate, and um, that uh, the patent system here in, in the EU does not specifically provide for software patents, even though no, they get granted. It, it, it specifically for business. Right. But we have that same situation in the U.S. where math is not supposed to be patentable. Yeah. The law is clear that most of the things that are being patented are not supposed to be patented. I agree. Um, so the law there is already, it's, it's, it needs to be a concerted effort at institutional change at the patent office, um, change through the courts. And, and I, I accept your point about shooting low, but unfortunately my background is doing political organizing. I know that complete abolition of the patent system is not on the table. Maybe it's on the table for the EU. Um, and I don't think that people should stop pushing for that. I think that sometimes in order to get people involved, you you bring them something a little bit more doable. Yeah, just one, one very, very rapid sure. point. Uh, I fear that what we, you might end up exporting as well might be your compromise solution, which may actually worsen the solution with the situation in some mm. other places. European elections are coming. Please vote well. Okay. Uh, I can take one or two more questions. Okay. One thing I always wonder about patents, as I understand it, it's an exclusive right to use some, something commercially. Yeah. So if I, as an individual, read a patent, like, like let's say a, a new video codec, mm -hmm. and I work on that in my free time and we implement it out of technical interest with no commercial interest and I send it out, put it on. on the mm -hmm. is it, is it, it depends. Uh, so. Um, it's interesting because I so commercial versus non-commercial, right? So um, it depends on where your software goes after afterwards. So like, um, if you're if you write something that then gets included in Fedora and then gets sent upstream to Red Hat, then then it becomes like a commercial interest. So maybe you don't care at that point because you're like, well, Red Hat's getting sued, not me. But it's but so if it becomes part of a part of a package, part of a selling point, th like what's commercial and what's not commercial? This is interesting because like we end up with the same problem when we look at the non-commercial uh, Creative Commons license. Like, what precisely defines commercial activity? Um, and then and then at the end, like you could get the letter and it could be annoying, and then you you like you might decide like, oh well, I bet like the court would find that my activity isn't worthwhile, you know, but. There's a, a fellow who, um, he writes uh, plugins for the GIMP. And um, someone at Borland was going through looking to monetize their patent holdings and he got a letter. Uh, I think he's a developer that lives in Germany. And, and he was like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have any money, but like also I don't want to hear any more about this. And, and, uh, and it's like keeping me awake. So he pulled them off the website. He posted something on his personal site that says like, please stop asking me. I took them down, I got a letter. So it's, it depends. Like you may decide, like, oh, I don't care if I get a letter. Like, you know, they're gonna take nothing from me. But uh, it can still be used to intimidate if you're, even if you're not, uh, you don't have money. But I mean, no, absolutely no commercial interest in it. I develop it in my free time. Yeah. Like, no, I understand. Yes. So you, yeah. So um, I would say that uh, when Microsoft sued TomTom, Tom, I don't think it was because they needed the money. I think it's because they wanted to squash a competing product like or p competing like not you know uh, a alternative to their product so even if you were not charging money if they didn't want your stuff out there they it's an injunction that you would get so, so my idea is that I'm not uh, I cannot be attacked because I didn't infringe a patent because it's not commercial no, you can still infringe a patent yeah you you money for it. Yeah. 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 License to practice the technology that the patent covers. No, Any, no, period. Period. If you write okay. the software and give it away for free, you could still be found to be infringing a patent. 
Yeah. So, and folks that make software available, but not, uh, but don't sell it, have been have gotten letters. So, it's it's less likely unless you have something exciting that somebody has a paid proprietary alternative to. But they might sue to stop you from distributing. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, well, thank you very much. I'm going to let the next speaker get ready.